Welcome everyone to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the March 3rd uh, Crop Talk uh, webinar. And uh, this week uh, we're going uh, to look more into some of the pulse crops and we're going to start uh, with uh, Dennis Lang uh, talking about uh, growing conventional soybeans and uh, I think towards the end he might have a little bit of an update or throughout the presentation he might have an update on on just soybeans in general uh, uh, acres and and uh, and management but uh, the presentation today is going to be mainly about conventional soybeans and with uh, the weather we've been having uh, the last couple of days and the weather that uh, they're talking about over the next few days, uh, we're going to start seeing black ground in a lot of places. So I think producers are getting more and more uh, in mind of uh, spring seeding. So uh, with that, uh, Dennis, I'll let you take it away and uh, start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Lionel. I'm just going to fire up my uh, slides here and then we'll kind of get into it here. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of been kind of interesting with the weather the last uh, couple of days here. Um, you get one day last year, last week we had one day of of uh, plus eight, and a lot of the snow disappeared, and and not much snow left in the fields here. A little bit left in the yard sites, um, so uh, a little ways away from seeding yet. But you know what? It's uh, it's gets it gets the uh, gets the feet itching to be outside these days. So uh, so today I want to talk to you about conventional soybeans. And, and uh, you know, some of the things growers need to know and be aware of. Um, before I get into that, I want to just do a bit of a review of last year's uh, production of soybeans in Manitoba. Um, there was quite a range again last year uh, in yields, 30 to 50 bushels uh, plus uh, that I've been hearing from growers. But when I looked at the uh, uh, MASC uh, yield Manitoba, uh, there were some 50 bushel uh, yields being reported as well. So really good much improvement over the for the for the last year. Uh, most of the ranges were in that 35 to 44 bushel per acre range. Um, our provincial average this year was definitely up as, as well. Uh, we hit 38 bushels an acre, and that's uh, that's quite a jump from the previous year of 28. But uh, in 2019, as we all know, the September was very very wet. We had a very dry summer, and some of the soy, soybeans were taken off in the snow, and some were taken off in the spring. So uh, yeah, definitely a, a big improvement over the previous year. Um, uh, what contributed to that uh, uh, yield, I guess, from this last year is is the rainfall uh, in 2020 was much better, especially at that critical time period when uh, soybeans need that moisture for filling. Uh, we did end up with an early frost in September, early September frost, I guess, in September in the west. Uh, it was looking pretty pretty bad the day, a couple of days afterwards, but. Uh, when it was all said and done, uh, soybeans for the most part were past the stage where any significant losses occurred. So uh, for the most part, everything worked out okay. But it, it just brings you a, a bit of a reminder that uh, soybeans are a long season crop. So you really need to be selective on the varieties that you're growing. Um, going uh, in 2020, we saw provincial uh, the uh, provincial uh, acres, uh, just over 1 million acres uh, with seed production included. And projections for the uh, 2021 season uh, in that 1.4 million acres. So we're, we're definitely looking at uh, an increase. Now, um, again, when you start looking at the contract prices uh, for this 2021 season, I've seen prices as high as 1360 a bushel. Um, and last year's prices hit in that $16 a bushel rate, uh, range. But with that 16, there really wasn't a lot of soybeans left in, in the pipeline anymore. So, um, you know, I think a lot of growers sold before that, which you know, it's still still profitable, but uh, uh, it's interesting that soybeans are following the trend of everything else this year. So uh, overall, you know, pretty optimistic for soybeans in general for this year, um, and uh, definitely looking at more uh, more acres moving forward. So um, this is a historic soybean production. I kind of put this up here, and this is kind of going to lead me into the conventional conventional um, uh, soybean discussion in a moment here. Um, our ten, five and 10 year average right now, when you include this year, we're uh, uh, looking at uh, 35 bushels an acre. And yes, growers have been able to obtain higher yields than that, but long-term, that's kind of where we're looking at. 
Um, when we look at this graph, what we're seeing here back in 2000, we had around 20,000 acres of uh, soybeans being grown. And at that time, they were pretty, they were all conventional beans. We didn't start seeing Roundup Ready soybeans in the, until that 2003, 2004 range. And, but in early 2000s, we were growing the Prudence, we were growing Gentlemen, um, we were growing McCall's and the McCall's and, and, and the Glaciers, it was another one. Those varieties were typically um, kind of um, varieties that we would pick up from North Dakota. They were maybe a little bit too long for us. And you can see here by the yields, we're only looking at about 30 bushel yields on 20,000 acres. So really not huge amounts. Um, fast forward, when we got more around the Brady uh, soybeans in, we started to see higher yields. And a large part of that was the weed control. Growers could really keep the fields clean and that would make a big difference. But uh, just to kind of give you a comparison where the soybean uh, yields have been. Um, moving forward, so we've talked about where the provincial average was this year at 38. Um, so what were the conventional beans look like this year? So I went to the market share report from crop insurance. And what I did is I picked up the conventional beans. So OEC Prudence, that makes up 8,200 acres of uh, the, the uh, soybeans being grown. That one was a little bit on the low side. That was at 25. Now with that one, um, I've always uh, always wondered how much of that is actually certified seed and how much of that is maybe you know uh, what we call bin run seed. So that's that's uh, um, an option I get or another option, but that's something that I've always wondered about because those yields are, are pretty low when you start comparing it to what our yields are like in the trials. Um, some of the other varieties that have grown, uh, DH863, uh, just under a thousand acres there, that did very well, 37 bushels an acre. Hannah. Uh, 765 acres at 39. Uh, Siberia, really early one. There were 6,100 acres there, uh, 35 bushels, so right in that five-year average. And Astor, which is one of the ones that are the longer season ones, there we're looking at 36 and about 1,200 acres. So just to give you an idea, these are kind of the numbers that we're looking at here. Um, so very competitive to what other uh, growers are growing on the more traditional herbicide tolerant side of things. So what do we know, or what should we know about conventional beans? Or in, in what I will be using is identity preserved beans, because that's what this market is really, is when you're working with a company, you're working with a specific variety to keep the identity uh, uh, pure for a customer that's looking for certain characteristics of that particular seed. So uh, conventional acres typically make up about 2% of our total acres in Manitoba. Uh, highland colors range from clear to yellow to imperfect yellow in color. Uh, you don't typically see any any black uh, uh, human consumption soybeans um, or identity preserved soybeans, um, mostly because that high on color can cause some problems in in the discoloration of the of the if it's going into a tofu product or or whatever. Um, and this may be an obvious statement, but I want to make sure it gets made. You don't use glyphosate, you don't use dicamba, and you don't use 2,4-D to control weeds in crop. That seems like an obvious statement, but it needs to be made. Um, with conventional beans, you need to control your weeds early, right from the start. So a good weed management package, and I'll talk a little bit more about that through the presentation. Um, the thing is with IP soybeans, they have desired quality traits, um, uh, taste, protein, oil content, and, and specific varieties are required by different end users, different requirements. So that's why it's a little different. Um, the variety, there's not as many varieties that there are in herbicide tolerant, and the buyers that are buying are buying specific varieties and targeting certain markets. And these markets, some of the major markets would be Japan, China, uh, Korea, and Malaysia. So one of the first things you should really look at when you're looking at uh, growing conventional beans or growing IP beans is to identify some of the buyers. And there are four main buyers in Manitoba, uh, ProGrain, Civita, uh, DNS Commodities out of St. Adolf, and Viterra. Uh, all of these companies have contracting programs and these companies also have preferred varieties and I'll, I'll mention those in a moment what those ones are but it's a good to have that that initial conversation to find out okay number one what are the premiums like uh, recently I've seen two to 250 per bushel premiums above commercial crush beans so those are some pretty attractive numbers when you look at today's number uh, today's values um, but you need to have those conversations to find out what their terms are on their contracts uh, what varieties are going to be best suited for your growing region and um, also to what some of the um, uh, what some of the some of these steps that you have to take when you're you know maintaining that quality. It's not like just putting it into a bin and taking it out. It means maintaining the the, the identity preserved of, um, 
a factor in the in the bean. So that means clean storage, and it means uh, making sure that uh, weed control is is under control and also good record keeping. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So what are var varieties are available for, for growers in Manitoba? So what I did is I went through Seed Manitoba and in the, uh, in the tables there, you will see these various varieties uh, listed uh, under the Seminus Prograin uh, umbrella here. Uh, you can see here Maxis, Siberia, Liska, and Maya are all uh, uh, some of the lines that they're, that they're moving forward with. Maturities range from um, you know a double zero point two all the way up to double zero point eight. So uh, so those uh, are some of the longer ones. Civita uh, has a good range as well, um, and uh, the, uh, some of the SVX varieties: Aster, DH eight six three, Meteor, Norfolk, Reynolds and Stanley. Those are some of the Reynolds and Stanley are some of the newer ones. Again, a range in, in maturity. So if depending on where you're you're planning on growing these beans, you you do have some definitely have some choices. Uh, Viterra is also in the market as well. Uh, they're looking at Albaca, Corina, uh, Floyd, and Quebec. And uh, there are some open lines as well. And uh, uh, those open lines right now haven't been, you know, they, they're, they're growing, they're tested in Manitoba. Um, and if you are looking at growing one of these open lines, then you need to talk to the buyers to see whether or not they, if they're going to fit their needs or not. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, there are a number of experimental lines. So there are some new lines coming up as well. And you can see here, I'm not going to go through the entire list, but I'm just going to make a point known that those the maturity groups uh, range from a double zero point three up to a, a double zero point nine, which is those longer season ones. Uh, those ones would be better suited for southern Manitoba. And some of those lines are coming out of the breeding programs um, in AFC Ottawa through Elwood Cobras program, uh, DL Seeds, uh, Seacan has some lines coming up again through the Ottawa program. And uh, Ceresco, SG Ceresco also has some lines coming up as well. So some pretty exciting times. Um, the one thing that's kind of different now than what it was, you know, back in the early 2000s is in the early 2000s, um, growers would grow the various varieties and then they try to find a market for it. And now the difference is you, you work with the company and you find, you grow the variety the company wants and they take their full production back. So that's a little bit different than the way it was. And I think that's one way of really kind of getting this market kind of off its feet and getting moving forward um, and maintaining the quality because these uh, IP soybeans, we do compete with Ontario. So um, as far as, because uh, they do grow a lot of IP soybeans in Ontario, but these companies have established markets around the world and they're, uh, they've established markets based on the quality of the soybeans that we can grow in Manitoba. So it's a little different process. So I think uh, moving forward now, I think, uh, we're going to see more more conventional beans uh, in here, and I'll talk about some of the weed control issues in a moment. Why growers might want to uh, potentially look at uh, uh, something a little different. So uh, we've all seen this maturity map many times. Um, this plays in the same way with conventional beans as it does with uh, Roundup Ready beans. Um, the red area here would be suited for your longer region or longer season beans. So those would be in that double zero point seven to double zero point nine maturity range. Um, once you get into the orange area, you you're, have a little bit more flexibility. You're looking at a double zero point three to maybe a double zero point six. And then when you start getting into the green and light green areas, then you're looking at double zero point three and earlier uh, and then into the triple zero maturity groups. And you really need to pay attention to those. Um, companies uh, have done a pretty good job at, you know, uh, making sure growers pick the right varieties for the area that they're suited in. But uh, if you have any concerns, kind of look at this map and just make sure that if you're if you're wanting to try something super long in an area that you know, maybe might not quite have the maturity, be, be forewarned that there could be some issues with frost in the fall. So um, the Metro Pulse and Soybean Growers uh, do run conventional trials in both the east and western part of the province. Uh, these are the results from Seed Manitoba or, or printed in Seed Manitoba from the uh, from the western sites. You can, a couple of things I want to kind of point out here. We still use Prudence as our check. Uh, we haven't established a new check as of yet. So um, the uh, Western site is still pretty new. We only have about uh, nine site years worth of data here. But a couple of things I kind of want to point out in this in this table here. Uh, number one, our average for Prudence is 36. So that's, that's uh, pretty respectable there. Um, this year at our different sites that we had, we had sites in Melita and Swan River. Um, Melita did was wonderful, 39 bushels per acre on the on the check this year. So when you're looking at some of these other lines, 103 percent, 
um, they are looking at some pretty, pretty um, good numbers there. And uh, when you look at the Swan River numbers, they're a little bit lower for sure. They're 31 bushels per acre. Um, you are limited a lot more on maturity in, in that zone as well. So I, again, you know, it's uh, just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, seeding dates, uh, Swan River was also planted quite late too, and that would explain uh, a, a part of the reason why those yields are a little bit lower. So it's, uh, it also goes to show you to get that early planting. Uh, maturities in this table as well. Um, you do have some here that are nice and early. Um, nine days earlier than the check, uh, three days earlier, for fewer to three days earlier. So it really has a, a fit for the West. Um, this next table is the Eastern Manitoba Conventional Soybean Trial, again from Seed Manitoba, and it was, it's uh, the data that's been provided by Manitoba Plus and Soybean Growers. Um, this table is quite interesting because it has a, a few things in it that growers need to be aware of. Um, number one, when we look at the bottom here, we look at prudence, and in the uh, we have 136 site years of data on prudence, so that tells us that prudence uh, has a lot of testing done on it, but their average is 47 bushels per acre. Uh, real respectable there. Maturity, um, uh, 112 days, so again, prudence is still a, a good mid-season, mid, mid to early season line, so um, that's uh, something you need to pay attention to as well. And the other thing to look at in this table is the IDC rating and grouping. So. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is IDC, but with this table, um, the one thing I've noticed with some of the conventional lines compared to some of the, the herbicide tolerant lines, um, the focus has been on the conventional lines for looking at protein and desired seed quality traits. Uh, yield has, you know, yields are very respectable, but things like IDC groupings or IDC ratings, um, some of the lines have a little bit more susceptibility to IDC. So you need to really pay attention to the field that you're, you're planning on putting these uh, conventional beans on to make sure that you don't have any issues with carbonates and salts. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And again, this is just uh, the additional table here um, for the individual site years. But you can see here that uh, uh, each of the early end core sites that we have here, the yields are listed at the bottom here. And again, ranging from uh, Stonewall at 32, to a high here of uh, Bossier at uh, 52, and as well as Portage at 52. So uh, check does really well, and you can it, this will kind of give you the one year off data here. And um, but overall, pretty happy with the results on the conventional trials this year. So okay, now this is something I kind of just want to bring to your attention since we have been talking about maturity. So these particular photos are taken at the Morris location this year, uh, Norfolk. Uh, um, on uh, September 16th, you can see here 95% brown pod, fully mature plant, uh, you know, the, the odd off type in here, but for the most part looks really good. Um, and then you go to the other extreme, which is Aster, which is September 16th. So this is why you have to be aware of, of where you're putting some of these varieties. Aster has seemed to have a very good yield potential, but to grow it up in, uh, in Western Manitoba it would not have a fit. Uh, this would be something more suited to the uh, Red River Valley, but it is still quite long. But this is what, on September 16th, what these two varieties look like. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind when you are growing longer season varieties that um, you don't want to be planting longer season varieties late. You want to be getting them in, in that May 15th to May 20th uh, at the very latest and get them in the ground so that you have a nice full season to work with and uh, maximize your yield potential. Okay, iron chlorosis. Um, I brought, I, I threw this, uh, this, the next few slides together here because I think iron chlorosis, especially in, in conventional soybeans, in order to get, be successful in growing the crop, you really need to be very selective on the field that you choose. So with iron chlorosis, um, it's that inner venal uh, yellowing that you see here. And um, uh, in extreme cases, you would see some stunting of the plant if you had a very susceptible variety. Uh, the ratings for the conventional soybeans Conventional soybeans range from a 1.6, which is a tolerant, which is your prudence. So there you'd see all the green, the leaves would be strictly green like that. You wouldn't see any yellowing uh, in that second to third trifoliate stage. And there's some beans that are in that 2.3 uh, uh, range as well. And uh, this particular plant here would probably be a little bit higher than that, maybe in that 2.5 range. You can see here that there's been a little bit of necrotic tissue that has fallen out already. So uh, IDC can affect uh, long-term yields, especially if it... Uh, uh, if it does persist for a long period of time. Um, 
and it's just something to kind of keep in mind. So you want to be selecting fields when uh, when you're growing conventional beans with low carbonates and low soluble salts to help reduce that risk of IDC. This next slide here is uh, an example of your soil test, and uh, and on the soil test that I have in front of you here, uh, the soluble salts are at 0.87 micromoles per centimeter. The carbonates are at 5.9 percent, which is considered high. Uh, this table is from the Manitoba Pulse Growers uh, Soybean Fertility Fact Sheet, and it uh, was developed through Agbias Laboratories. So carbonates are along the top, soluble salts along the side. So if we use these values of carbonates at 5.9 percent, then we're up here and we look at salts at 0.8 and we get down to here so that means this particular field is very high for uh, susceptibility to iron chlorosis so that uh, that would be where you'd want to uh, be very careful and choose a variety that has a low idc score something in that 1.6 to 1.8 range so that way if you do have some tough growing conditions that uh, it won't be affected too too severely um, if you have a field that, um, uh, if you're growing a variety that has a 2.3 score or higher, then on this field you could be, you, depending on the on the year, you could end up with some some yellowing through the growing season. And depending how long it persisted, if it persisted into that fifth or sixth trifoliate stage, there could be some yield reduction. So it's just one more tool you can use. Some of the keys to growing successful conventional soybeans, in some respects, are are similar to what they are in Roundup Ready. Um, good plant, plant establishment will definitely aid in weed control uh, for with plant competition. Uh, choosing a variety a good, with good germination, good vigor, uh, will help those plants compete with the weeds as well. The uh, target populations um, established in that are very similar, 140 to 160,000 plants per, per, uh, per acre. And um, you're planting, if you're solid seeding, you're planting in that 200 to 210,000 seeds per acre. Um, again, that's the distinction that you need to make is what are you planting versus what you have emerged. I tend to be a little bit, recommend a little bit higher, uh, especially in the conventional range to be upwards in that 210 range, just because that way you have more plants to compete with the weeds. And um, you, you definitely want to end up somewhere in that 160, but being on the higher side when you're planting, just because sometimes you have higher seed mortality due to dry seed, um, or uh, had rough handling of the seed, you want to make sure you uh, you end up in that target range. Uh, if you're planting uh, uh, row crop conventional beans, then uh, you can probably drop your rate a little bit because mortality is definitely lower in, in row crop production um, or with a row crop planter, I guess, and you can, might be able to drop your uh, rate to 180 to 190 seeds planted. So uh, just something to keep in mind for that. Um, a couple of side notes when it comes to growing conventional beans, and, and I mentioned this earlier about, you know, that it, they're not Roundup Ready beans, they, they use different chemistries to control weeds. Um, but one thing you really need to keep in mind as far as maintaining the quality uh, of your IP soybeans is you need to keep at least two full growing seasons between a herbicide tolerant variety and a conventional soybean. Um, because if you don't, uh, you run the risk of uh, GMO contamination in your uh, IP soybeans, and that would uh, eliminate your market for you. So if you had soybeans in year one, the herbicide tolerant, went back to a uh, wheat in the second year and decided to put soybeans, uh, conventional soybeans in the third year, that's where the greatest risk would, uh, uh, you'd have with uh, volunteers coming through. And again, you know, um, you won't be able to control those volunteers. So that's why I suggest keeping those two full growing seasons. Uh, volunteer corn is also contamination risk, so avoid putting conventional beans on corn ground. And uh, the proper inoculation uh, is also important, um, especially if you're growing soybeans on a ground that hasn't seen it in a few years, uh, using that uh, double inoculation where you're going liquid on seed and granular um, uh, sideband is a good way to do it to build up those uh, bacteria numbers. Uh, weed control, um, that's the next step here that uh, is definitely a lot different. Uh, in, in this system, uh, you're growing conventional beans. And again, probably the biggest thing in weed control, and, and I say this because I've seen some drift issue, issues over the years, is if you're growing a conventional soybean, let your neighbors know that you're growing conventional soybean. Um, because from the roadside, a soybean looks like a soybean. It doesn't matter if it's conventional or, or uh, around the brady. And what ends up happening, and we've seen this in different instances where uh, traditionally there's been herbicide tolerant soybeans growing in an area and the grower decides to grow a conventional one year and doesn't tell his neighbors and uh, lo and behold the neighbor sprays th thinking that well a little bit of Roundup moving from one field to the other is not a problem because it's they're all around the pretty soybeans and then you end up with some drift issues. 
So that's probably the, one of the important things when it comes to you know the uh, growing conventional beans is that just let your neighbors know that th these are different types of soybeans that you can't spray Roundup on and uh, keep those things in mind. Um, weed control does definitely have a different management practice um, than your herbicide tolerant systems. Uh, they're a lot more forgiving in some respects. If you're a little bit later on the weed control, you can, uh, or I guess any example I'll give you is that in a uh, herbicide tolerant system, if you have a, uh, a low plant stand in that 80 to 100,000 uh, uh, plants per acre range, it's much easier to keep the weeds under control in that system versus a conventional system. So that's why I'm, uh, uh, that's why I always recommend a higher seeding range just to make sure you have enough plants there. Um, with the, the IP systems or the conventional systems, start with a relatively clean field, avoid uh, fields that have persistent weed challenges such as wild buckwheat, lamb scores, and kochia. Um, um, you should start with some type of pre-plant incorporated or uh, pre-seed burnoff herbicide. That's a great way to kind of keep those early season weeds under control. Um, you can follow up with timely and early weed control throughout the growing season. Some growers still use edge and treflan. That's another, another option in that mix as well if you're looking for some longer season control. Um, what I'll do is uh, um, it does take weed control in conventional beans does it does take a bit more management than the Roundup Ready system. But what we're also finding now too is that uh, with uh, some of the problem weeds like volunteer canola and the herbicide tolerant systems, uh, growers are still having to come back with some other products. So those costs aren't as far as apart as what they used to be when growers just spray glyphosate. So another you know I guess another feather in the cap of uh, uh, IP soybeans is those chemical costs aren't maybe quite as uh, um, far apart as what they used to be. Um, what are our options for weed control? Um, I, and I'll throw this one up here, this slide up here. This is a slide for uh, controlling volunteer canola in, uh, in, in soybeans. So you have a few things pre-seed, you have clean start, express SG and heat. Um, all those must be mixed with glyphosate. So that can be done pre-seed. Um, in crop, you're looking at Bachelor Grand Forte, uh, Odyssey, Reflex, if you're in the Red River Valley. Uh, only uh, Pursuits is another option, and Viper would be the, the last option. Um, the next slide here, this is a slide that was put together a, a couple of years ago, and it lists all the various products that you can use. So you can see here, uh, there are a number of other products that you can use as a pre-plant, uh, pre pre-emerge, um, that will get other weeds as well. And you can see here that list here, things like Edge and Authority are, are, is, is there as well. Uh, Post-emergent products, um, you can see the list here. Um, you got the Cleodems, the Mazapores, the, the Odysseys, uh, and uh, as well as the Reflex, reflex Bassagran, as well as Straight Bassagran, if you're um, that you can also use. And of course, Reflex can only be used in the Valley. Uh, there's a couple products in here. I'm just going to make a, a bit of a note on um, Ultra Blazer and Pinnacle. Uh, they definitely have some restrictions on on use, and and if you are looking at using those products in your weed control program. Uh, keep in mind those restrictions or certain soil types that uh, under blazer that has some has some issues. Um, it is definitely a harder product and you have to be a little bit more careful with those products so it's not my first go-to when it comes to using um, using those products in weed control and conventional beans because it can actually set them back a little bit so you really need to weigh the options whether or not those products are going to be best for your particular uh, uh, circumstance so really look at your weed spectrum know what weeds are there, do some early scouting before before spring to know which are the best products that you can use, and then do some follow-up scouting as well uh, once, uh, you know, about a week afterwards just to see what, uh, what weeds are, uh, are there. You may end up, if you go with something like a, a Viper uh, ADV, you may end up following up with some bass around later on in that system just to make sure that all the weeds are under control. Um, some of the things that you need to be aware of though with conventional beans is, is uh, you really need to make sure uh, in this IP system that you, you have a clean combine, you have clean augers, clean and, and clean belt conveyors, uh, clean your bins, clean your trucks. It sounds kind of repetitive, but you don't want any risk of, of contamination with, uh, uh, with any Roundup Ready soybeans. So if you do end up growing both systems on your farm, which is, can be a little bit challenging, especially um, trying to keep that segregation at harvest time, uh, I would try to recommend harvesting your conventional beans first. Um, that way you do reduce the risk of, uh, of contamination as well. And uh, most of these companies have, uh, you know, record sheets that you will need to complete as well to make sure that they can, uh, you know, follow these IP steps through the growing season and making sure that all this equipment is cleaned and no risk of contamination. So that does take a little bit more time and effort. 
um, but uh, it is definitely something that's still manageable. Um, come on, some of the last couple of slides I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with here. Um, rolling soybeans, I think, in conventional is probably uh, is something that growers need to be uh, concerned about, I guess. Um, over the years, especially this last spring, um, there was definitely some rolling happening last spring, and in some areas with the, when the winds picked up, um, we did definitely see some soil moving. Um, I always like to use rolling soybeans as, as kind of like, well, number one, do you have stones? You know, of course, that's the most obvious one. So if you if you have stones, rolling soybeans, definitely is going to help with the harvesting procedure. Um, there are some different options, though, for rolling. Um, again, rolling at this stage is not good because there you're going to do a lot of damage. But if uh, you are in, entering into a dry spring and you still want to roll, uh, waiting till that first trifoliate stage or even at fo uh, full unifoliate just before that on a warm sunny day, 25 degrees, and we're rolling in the afternoon, is a way to roll and, and help reduce that uh, wind soil erosion uh, aspect to the uh, to rolling soybeans. Um, I, and rolling soybeans in conventional uh, uh, definitely does have some benefits because it, it's going to get you a little cleaner sample as well. Um, you know, if you're if you have a nice flat surface to work off of um, versus in a, in a Roundup Ready system, uh, that one, if you have a little earth tagging on, it's usually not much of an issue. But in the conventional beans, that can be a bit more of an issue as well. So uh, my thoughts on rolling is, is it definitely has a place in soybean production. Um, uh, if you have stones, that, that's the first place you want to look at uh, rolling a field. Uh, if you don't have stones and you have a, a reasonable good spring, then rolling right after seeding uh, is, is okay. But if it's a dry spring and you're concerned about soil erosion, waiting until that uh, first trifoliate stage uh, will definitely uh, help you out. It'll, it'll allow that those stones to be pressed in and uh, still give you, uh, you know, not without damaging the plants too much. So in summary, some of the things just to kind of finish off on here, um, I've mentioned through the presentation, two years between conventional and herbicide uh, tolerant beans to reduce that risk of contamination. Uh, talk to your buyers to see what varieties they prefer um, because uh, that will definitely help things along the way. Um, they're, they, a lot of, they typically buy back the production that they sell in the spring. So that way you always have a home for it and, and, and uh, um, ask the questions about, you know, do the contract premiums make sense to you? Uh, do the do, penciling it out. Uh, seed costs. Uh, I did some rough numbers or a, a, a rough uh, uh, calculations here, I guess, and, and talking to a few companies, I guess. And so, seed costs for conventional beans are going to run you in that thirty-eight to forty-five dollars per unit, uh, where around the ready beans are going to run you in that fifty to sixty uh, dollar per unit range. So it's uh, there is definitely a, a difference in the seed pricing. Uh, weed control might be a little bit more expensive, but again, uh, with weed control. Um, with growers having to add something else for glyphosate in the herbicide or, or having to add something else in for the uh, problem weeds like uh, uh, like wild mustard, then those costs are a lot more a lot closer. Um, maintain your early and, and good long season weed control, very important in conventional beans. Uh, good field records and maintaining identity preserve protocols. Um, again, that's something that you will have to do when you're growing conventional beans. And um, harvest conventional beans before herbicide tolerant beans, if you can, just to re reduce that risk. Uh, with that, that's what I had for my discussion here today. So uh, I open it up for any questions you guys may have. Okay, Dennis, uh, good presentation. And uh, yes, there is uh, there is some questions here for you. So uh, I'll start with uh, well, the first one here is, is IDC persistence considered when scoring for IDC as there may be differences between genetics? Uh, can you repeat that question? I didn't quite get the question there. Okay, is IDC persistence considered when scoring for IDC as there may be differences between genetics? Um, there are definitely. Um, there are, like when we rate the varieties in the trials, um, we, we will rate the varieties like, or I guess just to give you an idea how the varieties are rated, uh, each year we run an IDC trial. Uh, each variety is tested three times uh, and it's looked at at least three times over, over a three-week period. So in the end, we definitely do see some differences between varieties. Um, a lot of times in the, uh, the, some of the longer season ones typically have a little bit better IDC score. But even from, uh, even from a grower standpoint, uh, if you see a field, whether it's conventional or herbicide tolerant, and, you, and it, it does definitely yellow through the growing season, 
ask the neighbor to, uh, what variety it is and then check the score because there is definitely some differences between the genetics uh, that are out there and the uh, herbicide tolerant ones uh, have been improving over the years um, and getting better and the, uh, the conventional beans uh, have been getting a little bit better but their focus has been on things like protein and yields um, versus the IDC uh, portion of it at this point. Okay, um, can you explain uh, the maturity ratings, uh, the number system one more time? Okay, um, so let's let's go back a little bit here. I'm just gonna quickly uh, go back to one of the slides here. And I'm gonna go back, and let's just do escape out of here. I'll go back here. So um, the rating system, uh, the way we rate the soybeans, so we'll just go to this one here, for example, we'll go full screen. And we are at, make sure we're at the same page. Okay, here we go. So in this in this slide here, what you see is we rate the maturity ratings. And let me just get my pointer up here. Um, we rate the maturity ratings based from day of seeding to day of 95% maturity. So for the check, Prudence. Um, Prudence matured in 112 days, and that's an average over all the sites that we, uh, that we uh, use to calculate this. And so if you're looking at these varieties here, six days, four, minus six, minus four, minus three, those, that means exactly what it looks like. It means that Norfolk is roughly about six days earlier, almost a week, whereas Siberia is only a couple days earlier. Uh, if you look at the other end of the scale, when you're looking here at some of the varieties here, uh, Meteor and Stanley and Astor, uh, those varieties are anywhere from a week to 12 days longer than the Czech. Um, those ones are would be more suited for the uh, kind of the Morris, uh, Winnipeg South area, and then Astor would be more just kind of right along the U.S. border. So uh, the earlier the earlier the variety, the better it is um, for if you're in an area that has limited maturity. Okay, um, I think they might have been asking about the double zero, like the ah, zero zero. Gotcha. Okay, okay. So let's go back up a little bit. So. Um, in this table, we haven't put the uh, maturity uh, the maturity groupings in here, but the way the maturity groupings work, and we'll just go here, um, uh, varieties that we grow uh, are based on uh, uh, heat unit ratings. And, and um, so when you look at a double zero maturity group, um, you have different levels within that double zero maturity group. So a double zero point nine would be more like an aster, which is that long season. And those are those are kind of company ratings. And I guess that's the difference between the company ratings versus the days to maturity. So we rate days to maturity, and that's what we post in our in our seed Manitoba guide. The companies will have um, you know relative maturity ratings, or I guess uh, um, or I guess they're called more or less uh, the uh, the groupings. And so those ratings. So if you're at a double zero point nine, double zero point seven. So those are kind of uh, long season varieties. If you're at a double zero point three to double zero point one, those are kind of the uh, they're, uh, they're early. And then if you're in the triple zeros, those are kind of the, the super early ones. So Norfolk, Fjord, Halley, those ones, those would be in a triple zero range. So the lower the number, the earlier it is, for lack of a better way, probably the easiest way to talk about it. Okay. Um, how does protein contact affect yield? And are soybeans in Manitoba grown more for protein or yield? Conventional soybeans are grown more for the protein. Um, their companies have picked these varieties specifically because of their protein profile. And of course the yield does come along with it. Um, there still needs more work or, uh, to be done on, on how to increase protein levels in some of these, uh, uh, some of these in general in soybeans, but the, um, the conventional beans typically have higher protein levels. So uh, at, on a dry matter basis, a herbicide tolerant bean in Manitoba would be in that 38 to 40% range, whereas the conventional beans are more in that 40 to 43% range. So they are definitely a lot higher. Okay, so is there any, just my add on question, is there any premiums yep. to? Um, that you'd have to discuss directly with the company, but they have preferred varieties that they work with, and that's why they're working with these because they know that the protein levels are what they require. So uh, those specifics, I, I can't answer if there's a, a bonus to that or not. That would have to be uh, um, answered directly by the company you're contracting with. Okay. 
If I see IDC in a field of beans, can I spray on liquid fertilizer to help bring the beans back? Only if you don't want to have a crop that year. <laughs> um, um, with, with that, um, there's an iron chelate product that they've been working with down in North Dakota. We've been working a little bit with it in, in Manitoba as well. That's been used as a seed treatment uh, to help uh, reduce IDC. But even the results there has shown that it won't make a susceptible variety tolerant. What it'll do is it'll, it'll make a, a, a semi-tolerant variety maybe a little bit more tolerant. But at the end of the day, um, if you have IDC in the field, again, the best thing you can do at that stage is not look at it for a week. Generally, they will grow out of it. But what you can learn from it is that if that field stays yellow for a while, then the next time you grow beans on, on that piece of ground, you want to choose a variety based on, on these scores that are listed here that has a better IDC score for that particular field. And that's where the whole uh, um, uh, carbonates and soluble salts discussion comes into play. Okay. Um, I think you might have mentioned that your slide was a little bit older, but the one question is, Dennis, you, uh, an updated slide, you're missing Authority Supreme. Yeah, and if you look at uh, the uh, Authority Supreme, though, that that initial slide that was on there, that was on for vol control of volunteer canola. And if you look at the slide after that, uh, we actually taught it had, uh, we'll just go to that slide here. Just give me a second here. We'll just go down a little bit. So Authority Supreme, if you look at the we control ones. Okay, so in this one here, this is we control options for volunteer canola. And the next one here, Authority charge and authority and authority supreme. Yes, it's all kind of falls into that same category. But yes, that's another option as well. So, okay, yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, okay, next question: Has any research been done on the effect of seeding an oats companion reducing IDC? Beans in wild oats patches rarely have IDC. Um, and not that I've been, not that I've been made aware of at this point. I'm not familiar with that. So, yeah, I've uh, never, uh, never thought of that either. Um, yeah, another yeah, with, comment. Uh, um, oh, uh, about heat complete and Zidu could be added. Um, Zidua. Yeah, Did there you? are some new products. Out. Yeah, there are some new products on that list. You just have to be. I I kind of posted this. Uh, there are some new products that have been coming coming down the list. I just have to check on Zidua here as far as their their tolerance there. But there is there is some new products definitely coming down the list that uh, that we can we can potentially look at. So, um, one comment was made that uh, should check with your soybean buyer before uh, and see if they're they're approving those products as well. Well, that's always that's always the issue, and that's where that conversation has to happen uh, initially because um, there, uh, you know, uh, there there are some different challenges that they may have for desiccation and those types of things that you have to be aware of uh, with a conventional bean more so than what you would ever on the Brady system. So, uh, one question here too: uh, uh, Where are most of the buyers located? Uh, like where would um, they, well, I guess, delivery points be? I guess is probably part of the question. Yeah, like if I if I go to that early slide that I had here, I'm just gonna go up the page here. Uh, right now, most of those are kind of in this in this zone here, I guess. And I say this zone, and I'm talking more like Carmen uh, Porter's that area there. Um, if I go back up a little bit here, oh, one more time. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, like if you look at Nadeau seeds um, up in that Fantasil area, there, there, there was Civita there. DNS Commodities is kind of in the St. Adolph area. Viterra would be Carmen, um, and Prograin has their their areas that they source from as well. So most of them are going to be in the in the east at this point. But uh, you'd have to talk to them about what kind of delivery programs they would have if you're further in the west. Okay. Uh, there is a delivery point in Oak River with Pro Grain. It just came up here as well. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thanks, Sean, for that. So. Um, okay. The next comment, our question is: Are disease packages similar between 
herbicide tolerant and conventional? Um, at this point, we don't have a lot of information on Phytophthora root rot um, resistant genes in the conventionals. That's why we don't list anything there. There hasn't been a lot of work done there. Um, overall, you're going to have very similar, you know, reactions to things like bacterial blight and uh, septoria brown spot in those ones as you would the other varieties. So, uh, for the most part, there is nothing that I'd be really concerned with. Um, the only thing I can maybe make a comment on, I guess, is white mold in areas where you have thick stands. Um, you might see uh, white molds. I wouldn't say it'd be more persistent, but it would still be there if you had a thick stand. But there's really no no differences in that respect. Uh, and on the Phytophthora side, I think the, the, there are some resistant genes that are available through the through the herbicide tolerant systems, but uh, nothing that's uh, been made available through the conventional at this point in time. So. Okay, and one last question that just came in. Um, uh, how heavy can I seed uh, conventional soybean? Um, you know, if as far as a top end, I think the bigger question there is what type of, um, I guess, stand establishment are you, do you have? So, and how good a job are you doing? Because I think that's the bigger question. Um, ideally, you'd want to be, you know, you want to have a stand establishment in that 140 to 160,000 plants per acre. That tends to give you, um, that tends to give you the best bang for your buck as far as yield goes. Um, now, to go a little higher than your, so that means you're seeding at a higher rate because you, that's what you want to end up with, right? So really, to me, uh, in a like. I've seen 250, and but then you don't want to end up with 200,000 plants because I think that might be a little bit too much and might have a little bit more more weed pressure. So really, you know, 220, 230 at the most. If you know you have some uh, issues with uh, with uh, dry seed or some stand establishment issues with your equipment, because the higher the mortality is, the higher the seeding rate you'll have to go. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think. That's. I'm just going to check the uh, question pane here just to see if there's any other questions that have come through. But I think that's got them all, Dennis. Uh, yeah. I'm just uh, as we're as we're as we're checking here. I'm just going to have a look at the Zidua here to make sure because I know there was there was some uh, there's some challenges there. And uh, we just got to make sure here that it's all good. But I'll, when you're back, I'll check this, and, and uh, if there's anything else, I'll send you a quick note uh, uh, just to address that question. So, okay, good. Well, uh, uh, great presentation, Dennis. Uh, got a lot of questions and uh, a lot of good answers from you. And I think uh, there's going to be a few more people looking into this conventional uh, conventional soybeans. Uh, for this coming year so uh, thanks again for uh, for doing that presentation no problem okay so uh, just want to I guess uh, finish up today by giving you the information of the farm production extension specialists in the province uh, there's their contact information their phone numbers and uh, email addresses uh, over the next little while here, there'll be some changes of addresses for some of them. So uh, we'll be updating that as uh, as time goes on by. But uh, that's where you can get a hold of them now. So if you've got questions or want to get a hold of any of our specialists, uh, you can definitely go through these people. And uh, if uh, you're wanting your credits, uh, there's Lori Forbes's uh, email address. And uh, I guess with that, that's... Uh, the uh, end of the presentation today, and uh, see you next time on uh, on Crop Talk. Fine, we'll have a quick question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just uh, had a quick look at the Zidua, I had a quick look at the Zidua label here, and it actually talks about uh, uh, pre-plant, pre-merge, um, uh, or pre-seed, pre-merge on herbicide tolerant soybeans. So uh, that one I'd be a little cautious on until I get more details on whether how it would affect the uh, conventional soybeans. So. Good. Thanks for finding that, Dennis. Thanks. And I think.